it, for some reason, there was a fear of going into this Italian community. And, you know, we were kind of happy that there was a fear also. The Hill is St. Louis's Little Italy. People, immigrants used to come and work hard and they bought a house, they had a family and they didn't know that that was the American dream. It was a marathon, it wasn't a sprint, it was a life that they created. And it was circled around the church, and it was circled around their work, and it was circled around their family. Everyone's grandmother lived with them. I mean, what community has families down the street? Uncle Lou was over here, and everybody else was over here. Everybody had that. You kidding me? We have started back in the mid-1800s and we're still going on and people are dying to get into this neighborhood. We have 52 square blocks, we have residents, and we have businesses side by side. You know, we are the last real Italian neighborhood in the whole United States. The place we call the Hill today has had a storied history before it was the Italian Hill. It had been a spa in the early 19th century, and then it had been a home for French Icarian communists. And then someone discovered in the 1870s, 1880s, that the clay there was perfect for making brick tile and terracotta and fire brick. Many, many brickyards evolved, steel mills, coin making factories, allowed for the explosion of industry in this area near the hill. It became a hot spot for jobs. Jobs usually brought a lot of immigrants. Why did the immigrants come? There were many reasons. Poverty being the greatest. Suppression of them. These were peasants, small town people, subjugated by the nobles and land barons. Political unrest, famine, brought all of them here. When I listen to the stories of my grandparents growing up, they left Italy to make a better life for their families. They came to the States with very little. I can remember my grandmother telling me she came with a paper bag in hand. When we come over, when we hear about America and Europe and Sicily, you look like you go to paradise. But when you come here, it's a winner. <laughs> it's no paradise anymore. When the Italians arrived, 
they really had no skills other than they're willing to endure long hours for low wages. But they had been preceded by African Americans in that area. It was, I guess, like a, the Mexicans are doing today. Everybody's, they're all looking for a job and the people here don't want those jobs. Well, they didn't want those jobs either. My grandparents both worked in the clay mine. Well, one was worked in the clay mines, one worked in the brickyards, and my dad worked in the foundry. He used to come home from working in that foundry. The calluses on his hands would be so thick he used to take a knife and cut them off. Every night when the men would be walking up from the clay mines back to the hill, they would raise their hands and say, La Montagna, La Montagna, and they would make the trek up the hill. So that's how the hill got its name. A lot of the men who came, came alone. And there were not that many women around and probably not many Italian women. There probably were other women that they could meet after they had worked their day in nearby places of entertainment, but they may not have had the uh, opportunity to marry uh, an Italian girl. If you're 20 years old in America, you want to get married, are you going to spend the money and time, months, going back to Sicily or Lombardy to find a bride? Why not ask your mother, find me a nicer girl just to like a you? Every once in a while, one of these men, these Northern Italian men, would get a letter from one of their neighbors. And it would say, how you doing in America, in essence? Got a nice job? Oh, by the way, here's a picture of our daughter. What do you think? She looking nice. Bring her over. I'll marry her. And these were called picture brides. My grandmother's family sent the picture over when he asked for a bride. She was 18 years old at the time, and he was a young man working in the clay mines. He was about six years older than my grandmother. And so they sent her over, and she came as an 18-year-old bride. If you were a young woman in Kajono, you had three options. You could become a nun, a swara. You could become a zitella, an old maid, or best bet, an Americana, a picture bride, or an Italian-American bride in America. They were not marrying for love. They were marrying for survival. And so religion and faith were very strong with your Italian immigrants, as most people know that. And it translated into the need and desire to build a church once you had enough people. It looked like a small Protestant clapboard building uh, with a heightened roof and a, a steeple. And as it grew, it became a fixture in the neighborhood. However, in 1921, that church burned down. That is a real challenge, it's a crisis for the community. The Hill bonds together and decides, we're not just going to rebuild, we're going to build something spectacular. To build that church, they knew they wanted to build it to last, and that was going to take money. So they did everything from selling every brick of the church to stained glass windows with the familia, the family names on it, to the communion rail, which is still there, which is Italian marble. Everybody said that they would give a dollar a month for five years, which was a lot of money back then, and uh, they saw it through. Eventually it cost about $285,000, finished in 1926, 
and was paid off in 10 years. The Hill is an Italian community that revolved around the church. I'm not sure there's another Italian American community where the church has been so central to communal life. Oh, it's the place where people meet. It's the place where people come to get baptized and buried and married. It's a place where, you know, particularly this group of people, the, the Northern and the Southern Italians can come and, and, and be together. People on the hill originally came from Italy. They had nothing. They had to believe in someone and something. So faith was critical to their overall well-being and development. Well, if that church hadn't been there, there'd be no hill. I can guarantee you that. It's like the church in Milano. In Milano, the church is the, the highest point in that neighborhood. Nothing is permitted to be built higher than the statue of the Madonna in the Milano Cathedral. And nothing in that neighborhood has been built higher than that church. And so now architecture is a big deal for the neighborhood besides the church. And in particular, which has grown now to be an affection more than anything, is our so-called famous shotgun homes. Actually, the concept started back in Louisiana when they used to tax homes by their width. The more narrow the house, cheaper the tax. But actually, it's an efficient way, when you look at them, to put a lot of homes on one block. Their houses where the rooms are just stacked up one behind the other with, uh, with you know, no hallways or general circulation. You circulate from one room to the other by going through the next room. Basically, if you fired a shot at the front door, a shotgun, it would go all the way through and hit the back door. There's nothing, no, no walls gonna get in your way. And basically, that's what it was. You walked into the place, was a living room. You walked through the living room, you walked into a bedroom. But you'd have then the kitchen, and then you're out the door, shotgun house. My brother and I had a bedroom together. We had twin beds, then my mother and father, and then we had the kitchen. And the bathroom was out in the backyard. So if you had to get up in the middle of the night, you had to get your father out of bed, which you hated to do. I think about my parents and those old timers that that worked with nothing. There was nothing here. They built the homes. There's some of the homes built right down here on Daggett. They were built with lumber from the World's Fair. Most of the Italians, let's face it, most of the Italians that came to this country were peasants. They didn't own anything. They got here, and now they own property. That was a big thing for them. They couldn't own property back in Italy. Here, they own property, and they're proud of it, and they want to show it to people at its best. Because the immigrants didn't have money, in many cases, for basements, they built these homes on stilts and then filled in the basements later when they could afford it with stone, brick, concrete, or whatever. And then sometime during Prohibition, you had to make room for a false basement for the still. But that's a whole other story. To understand Prohibition, you have to understand it's part of a series of laws, interestingly aimed at immigrants. Almost all Catholics hated Prohibition. Almost all Protestants thought, if we just got rid of liquor, it's going to be a panacea. Everything's going to be perfect. I solemnly promise, God helping me, to abstain from the use of all distilled, fermented, and malt liquors. Amen. 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 St. Louis was actually a a fairly significant player in the industry of alcohol with the uh, Anheuser-Busch company, that type of thing. So it wasn't very popular and there was a lot of money to be made in the production of alcohol. So, you know, bathtub stills, basement stills, these things 
kind of popped up everywhere. And the hill was, you know, not immune to that. I could say 98% of the people I talk to, I'm talking about 100, 200 people I talk to, every one of them said their father or grandfather made moonshine. Well, there was a lot of stills on the hill. My dad was, uh, when he was a kid, he had a bicycle and he used to, do, <laughs> he, he delivered booze to places. He used to deliver cans of alcohol. He got a buck a can for delivering it to wherever it went. There was one guy that built a still over on Northrop Avenue. And he was smart enough that he piped the stuff over to Shaw Avenue. One day it snowed, and the heat from the booze going through the pipes melted the snow, and you could follow that line. My dad had a huge garden, and we were cultivating it. One day I told my dad, Dad, I hit a pipe. He says, cover up, don't worry about it. I said, but there's a pipe, Dad, it runs all across. Don't worry about it, just cover it up. I said, okay, Dad. Down the street, we're playing ball and all the police come and they raid this house and they bust it still. The guy was making booze there and pumping it up a whole block away to another house where they would put it in cans and distribute it. I, I've got stories in my head, you know, how they were very creative in hiding the moonshine, you know, putting it on soda trucks, sodas on the outside, moonshine on the inside, putting on buses that took the women to the garment factories, and then having the moonshine underneath and delivering it after they dropped the women off. It is likely that there was someone who was organizing, um, who could control distribution to other parts of St. Louis County, St. Louis City, to even parts of Illinois. I can tell you there was a guy named, that was supplying the sugar for the booze, called Sugar Vince. Sugar Vince, he bought and sold sugar. You see, back then, there used to be a company in St. Louis called Meyer Brothers. You could get 100 pounds of sugar for $6. But they never sold it to anybody except soda factories, bakeries, things like that. We were approached a lot, a lot of time by certain people wanted to buy sugar. No, we never did do that. We could have, we could have probably made a lot of money and I'd probably be dead now. Not by natural causes either. <laughs> During the 20s, 30s and 40s, I'll go back that far. Probably 75 or 80 percent of the people that lived on the hill walked to work. There was no such thing as having cars at that time. <laughs> there were very, very, very few <laughs> cars, <laughs> if any at all. Uh, it's sort of funny, although growing up on the hill, my dad had no driver's license. His brother Lou had no driver's license. His brother Dan had <laughs> no driver's license. But at that time, it was just, you walked around and everything was there. There was probably a confectionery on every corner. There was grocery stores, taverns, dry goods stores. Everything that you could possibly want was here on a hill. We had a school, we had a bank. You know, what, what did you need in life, you know? We had a movie theater, which was a Columbia theater, which was a way the parents would get rid of us on a Sunday. We had a funeral parlor. I mean, how many neighbors could have a funeral parlor in their neighborhood? You could be born here, live your whole life, and when you pass away, you could bury you here because you had, a, had a, a funeral parlor. We were different. This neighborhood was two-thirds Lombard descent. 
one-third Sicilian descent. And since our Sicilians were embedded with these Lombards, we took on some of their personality. We were more laid back than your typical Southern Italian. Yeah, when you think of Italians in America, you go, hey, this, hey, hey. No, that's Southern Italians. Northern Italians are more European, okay, more conservative in their approach to things. And that was the nature of this neighborhood compared to other Italian neighborhoods. On the hill, there was a huge chasm between North Italy and South Italy. And both North Italians and Americans looked down upon Southern Italians. It goes back to the old country, to Italy. Uh, Italy, until uh, 1859, there were numerous different Italian states. And there was always a rivalry and an animosity between them because they're constantly fighting going back to the Middle Ages for our territory, our recognition. There's a definite divide. The best way to explain it would be New Yorkers compared to people from Alabama or Mississippi. We say we're all Americans, but there's a distinct difference there and that's kind of the way it's, uh, uh, how they're viewed and how they view each other. Do, do you know if there was any Northern versus Sicilian Italian uh, prejudice on the hill? Tremendous prejudice on the hill. <laughs> and and uh, there, uh, I remember the Sicilians used to get very upset when they heard someone say, Vindanun, which mean, meant one of us. <laughs> I said, what? I thought we were all Italian, but those days they were even married. I know a couple of guys that married a Sicilian woman, they got thrown out of the house, and the girl they got thrown out too. I didn't know until I was married, not before. You start talking with the Sicilian dialect, and a, a northern Italian would stop you, and they immediately said, what, what do, no cabbage, you know? We speak Italian here. Oh, scusi, okay. Well, I even hate to say this, but my mother hated Sicilians. I mean, she just didn't, didn't agree with the Sicilians. And it, it was just so different. I mean, I think all of them, they just, there was just something between the Lombards and the Sicilians that they couldn't get along. At one time, the Sicilians and Lombards were like uh, two animals that didn't want to get along together. And it went on a long time. Until the, the younger people got together and we were going to school together, and we had no reason to fight, fight each other. Every block had a club, athletic clubs, because we always used to play softball against each other. There were the Stags, the Ravens, the Hips, the Cubs. The Fawns, the Hawks, the, the Wildcats. You got the Vikings, oh my God, I can go on and on. And one of the things that happened to us is that we met a guy from the Southside YMCA called Joe Casino. We used to call him Uncle Joe. Joe Casino may be as important as any of the priests in the 1940s. He was instrumental in keeping this neighborhood from going to hell. But starting these sports clubs prevented the formation of gang-like activity versus sports social-like activity. One of the great challenges to the Hill is the second generation boys. Across America, you'll read a lot of stories about gangs particularly Italian gangs. I mean, think about this. Your dad wants you to be Italian, but you're really American, and you're getting in fights a lot in schools. And Uncle Joe comes in and says, basically, what's the matter with you? He said, why are you fighting one another? He used sports as a medium of uniting the hill, but particularly harnessing youthful energy in a positive way. 
Some of the greatest athletes in sports history emerged from these clubs on the hill started by Joe Casino. Most notably, Yogi Berra and Joe Garagiola. Baseball was in their blood. I mean, that's all they cared about. Yogi used to, that was his whole game, baseball, morning, noon, or night. He talked baseball, loved to play baseball. That's why he didn't do too well in school. He had too much on baseball. And at that time, they never called him Yogi. His name was Lawrence Peter Barra, and his mother called him Lottie. Because she couldn't pronounce Larry, she called him Lottie. He used to sit out when we were in the park. He'd sit there with his leg cross all the time. We were sitting by the lights in the lamp post or so, or maybe on Elizabeth Plane, and one of the fellows went by and he said, looks like a yogi. And that's how Yogi's name stuck. Yogi Vera, I went to the same school he was, was in. He was a hell of a, a ball player. We used to, we used to play with a 14-inch softball. And, and the school used to have a recess, you know, about a half hour or so. They used to play ball. He used to knock that ball out of the schoolyard. I had pitched a little batting practice to Yogi because I had a good arm and I was a young kid, but I, I, I didn't want to throw the ball down the middle of the plate because he hit he would hit me with it if he if I did. But uh, Yogi was a heck of a hitter. Joe and Yogi were both good ball players. All around athletes, Joe was the best, but Yogi was the best hitter. Well, when we used to play with. A little pickup game, we used to split Yogi and Joe up. Couldn't have them both on the same team. And Joe would pitch one day, and Yogi would catch. And then we'd play another team, and it'd be vice versa. And we did that for a whole summer. They would leave in the morning, they would go to other neighborhoods around the area, they would play ball against uh, other neighborhood kids. And as my uncle would say many times, he wasn't even the best ball player on his block because Yogi Berra played on his same team. You know, the Hill, we know about the baseball players that lived on the Hill and grew up, but baseball wasn't the sport. Soccer was the sport that a lot of the neighborhood kids played. There was three, four, five different neighborhood soccer teams that played on the Hill. The two pillars of sport in St. Louis because of permanence, longevity, baseball, and soccer but in particular, the sport of soccer and what five guys from the Hill did on June 29th, 1950, defeating England in the World Cup in Brazil, brought international acclaim to the city of St. Louis. Oh man, you talk about a Hill proud. That was a proud day. Especially when they carried uh, Frank Borgie off of the field. Oh, what a day that was. If you looked at a sweeping view of America, World War II is both kind of the high water mark for many Italian American communities, but also the beginning of the end. This is the perfect storm. You have Italian families with lots of sons. And they're embarrassed by Mussolini. FDR was about to incarcerate Italian Americans like he did Japanese Americans. And we heard about that. 
the Italians, they were, they were faced with a lot of prejudice. Uh, example, uh, when uh, Missouri Bakery uh, opened up and they didn't put the name of the owner, Gambero, on the, the trucks because kids would throw rocks at it. You go places and you, you're Italian, you what? You know, things like that. Like they resented us. And believe it or not, we didn't resent them. We went there to do business and stuff like that. Some of them even stay away from the business because they were Italian. I remember as a kid, they sent me to the hardware store. I did, then I was standing there looking around and some jackass, whatever you want to call him, come up to me and said, Hey, Dago, get back there on the hill. Percentage-wise, Italian-Americans went into the military more than any other ethnic neighborhood in the country to show their patriotism. And they flocked to the Army drafting stations. I'd be hard-pressed to name another neighborhood that was as patriotic and supportive of the war as the Hill. One block, I think, on Daggett Avenue sent 55 young men to the war. I mean, it's extraordinary. I was about three or four years old when my dad got drafted into the service. It nearly wiped the Hill out of young people, I want to tell you. It was tough times though, because a lot of a lot of families were without people that were making a few bucks for them. So tough times. But the Hill was proud of their boys fighting for the American cause. Every home as you went walked along the hill. At that time, if you had someone serving in the service, you put a star in a window. Some had two, three, and four stars in the window. They were different colored stars. The solid gold stars were the stars. <laughs> Damn it. Have, who? They were stars of the boys that never came back. The GI Bill of Rights is not a reward, or a handout, or a gravy train, but rather an American way to make it easier for each man to take his place once again in the community and get some of those things for which he went to war. A job, a business, an education, a home. If you were a city planner, and you came to the Hill in 1945 and asked, what's the future of the Hill? The answer almost certainly would have been, it cannot last. This isn't a trend that had something to do with the Hill. This is a trend that had something to do with post-World War II America, where you know, your goal in life was to grow up someplace and then eventually move to the suburbs, get a bigger house. That was, what, uh, that was what America wanted. And uh, they realized they were kind of swimming upstream um, against uh, sort of a national trend and, um, and wanted to figure out how to bucket. Like most 
neighborhoods, urban, things started slowly because all these GIs all at once returned. He had all this pent up desire to get married. And so what you had in most neighborhoods, urban settings again, was crowded conditions. But here's where it changes. West of a street called Sublet on a hill, there were a few older homes, but mostly vacant lots. And here you had all this, maybe a half square mile of territory, pristine and unused. The next thing you know, everybody's building a home and moving in. This place probably doubled the number of, of homes. When the young men returned from the war, they wanted to stay in the neighborhood where they grew up, where their roots were. They didn't want to go outside or move to the suburbs. They wanted to live here, build their houses, raise their Italian family, just like their parents did. Looking at the hill as a whole in the 60s and 70s, in some ways it was a cocoon that all the countercultural forces, Woodstock, the summers of love, all the disintegrating elements didn't seem to affect the hill. Things were changing back in the 60s, and a lot of things on the, you know, around the nation were changing, but it seemed like on the hill, things really didn't change. It it's kind of stayed the same. I would say that I had a pretty sheltered childhood. Everything to make you happy and to make your life wonderful was here in the neighborhood. In the early 1960s, a new leader emerges on the hill, Father Salvatore Polizzi. He had a vision for the hill, and he wasn't afraid to speak his own mind, even if it rubbed some people the wrong way. Father Polizzi was not a shy man. He could be brash, he could be in your face, but the goal was always for the betterment of the hill. He was witnessing the decline of all these immigrant communities. Across America, little Italys were dying. So I think that's an important part of his mindset is the hill should be preserved. This is a fight worth fighting. Uh, I, th I think you have to look at the time that we're talking about. I mean, there was a feeling in the United States, you know, that American cities were kind of doomed for whatever reason, to, you know, the uh, suburbanization, ethnic prejudices, and there was a general feeling about in the country, not just in St. Louis, so that there was really not much of a future for cities. Other neighborhoods all to the east of the hill uh, just fell completely apart. The Shaw neighborhood right past us was in the 70s, the highest crime rate. It was worse than any other crime you see going on right now. It was a war zone, battle zone. Monsignor saw all that occurring around us. He saw the natural barriers and trying to keep people to stay is what made this neighborhood so unique. None of us left. Did you ever see a for sale sign on the hill? No. No, that was all. It was like it, it was, I think it was the first insider trading, okay? No, everything went through him. I mean, everything went through him. Plitzy would sit down and he would put the property owner together with a list. See, we used to have a list here. If you wanted a house on a hill, you'd come and put your name on a list. It wasn't to keep realtors out or keep, you know, keep different ethnic groups out. It was, we had a hundred people that grew up in this neighborhood that want to live in this neighborhood. So what Plitzy did was very simple. You got a house, I got a person, let's go to the bank. They got a loan, everybody wins. The 1970s presented Polizzi and the Hill with three great challenges and crises. Someone wanted to pump tens of thousands of 
effluent into abandoned clay mines. And Polizzi in the hill stopped that. There was a project to build a drive-in movie theater on the hill. They mobilized forces and stopped that. Those were kind of relatively easy challenges. The greatest challenge was Interstate 44 wanted to lop off an island off the northern edge of the hill. This was a big deal that they were not, they were going to be disconnected. This was dividing the hill. That was the big thing. The hill was going to be divided. Terrible. Everybody, it was terrible. Uh, you know, the hill isn't 50,000 people. It's probably, uh, I don't know, what, 1,500 families? And we grew up on Pattison, so they took our house. And it took lifelong residents and people that have put their heart and soul in here, that lived here for 30, 40, 50 years, had to move. Businesses were shut down, and people that you were born and raised with were gone. Uh, the, the lore I've been told all my life, and I believe has been documented, there's a, at least two or three people who died of heart attacks knowing that their home was taken away from them. They've come here from the old country to make their life. They found their life. They found a community, a church, and a sense of being, and it was all taken away from them by the government, and they just could not believe it. I just thought it was a disaster that they were gonna come through that neighborhood. And there was no rhyme or reason for them to do what they did. They could have moved that thing another block north and all the people would have been on one side of that highway. And we decided we were going to fight it. So there was a movement on the hill, really led by Father Polizzi, uh, to build an overpass uh, that allow people to go across and keep the hill from being so separated. And all the political leaders on the Hill joined forces with uh, leaders of the Democratic Party, certainly in Missouri. I think their primary concern was, in the event of emergency, getting first responders into that part of the neighborhood. But I think a strong, strong secondary reason they wanted that overpass was because of the people that were isolated on the other, way, other side of the highway. They could have a way to get across without going to the busy Kings Highway or Macklin Avenues. It might be Polizzi's finest hour, the Hill's finest hour. They went to the city, no luck. They went to Governor Hearns, and Hearns turned them down, that we can't do anything about it. The only place left was the federal government. Nixon is president. His secretary of transportation is John Volpe an Italian-American, and they had a conference in Washington, D.C. Someone made the famous pledge, the Hill will put in a chip worth $50,000. Hardly enough money, but it was a symbolic chip. And Nixon, Volpe, all agreed, we'll build the overpass over the Hill. Symbolically, this is huge. The Hill took on the feds, it took on Jefferson City, it took on St. Louis City Hall. They won. After the Highway 44 victory, Father Plitzy would become recognized throughout the United States for his efforts. He was named as one of the most promising leaders in Time Magazine, and President Jimmy Carter even offered him a position at the White House that he turned down. Father Plitzi's sole purpose was to serve the people of the Hill. However, his tenure at St. Ambrose would be cut much shorter than anyone expected. I just think that uh, it was my whole life was up there, and so I just really didn't want to leave the neighborhood. But you know, we're priests and we're sent, and I got the call to come here, and so I came here. so important to the Italian people? Well, because it's the best one we got. Eat, it's number one. We eat, that's all we do, eat. That's all you want, everybody get fat. Because <laughs> you eat, you know what I mean? 
food. Well, it goes without saying, when you think of Italians, you think of food. It's cliche and it's stereotypical, but you've got Sunday dinner. That was the focal point of the week. You had everybody, grandma, grandpa, the kids, the babies, moms, the dads, the aunts and uncles all around a communal table with giant bowls of pasta and meatballs and salsa and bread. You know, you started at three o'clock and at eight o'clock at night you were heading home. Let me tell you something, on Sunday, there wasn't a better smelling neighborhood than the hill. All the moms being there cooking, everybody made sauce on Sunday, everybody. So it was the best smelling neighborhood. The aroma of all the different foods coming from different homes. You walk home from school and the moms were cooking already, or the grandmas, and there was just sense of food everywhere. And it was an Italian smell and it just, and the bakeries. The garlic and the olive oils and the, oh, I mean, uh, geez, it was just humble in their own bread. They're, a lot of people made their own, own bread and they baked their own bread because in the basements and a lot of these homes up here on the hill, there are sub basements where they had a stove and uh, they baked their own bread. It was really something when you walk from my house to the church, you were hungry, man. It's like the whole world of the universe of food has conspired to be in one spot in the city of St. Louis for the Italian vintage. And it's true, there are about 28 restaurants and delis in the Greater Hill area. On Saturday you can't walk. Has so many people, all the stores are packed. Restaurant is all packed, everybody. Any restaurant they go, it's packed. I think the Hill is experiencing a renaissance unbelievable right now. And the Hill has always been a stable neighborhood because people watch out for each other. You know, people really care about their roots and where they came from. And a lot of people are moving back to the Hill. It means a lot to me to come back to the house that I was born and raised in. I guess I could have moved someplace else, but it, it didn't feel like home. This has always been home and always will be. It's a great place to live. And people are particularly now are appreciating that. And I can only say that it's, it's just the people who lived there and who wanted to continue to support it sort of through you know, the, the various ups and downs of uh, real estate in America. One thing about the Hill, one of the ways that we've kept it special and kept the generations on the Hill is we have a tendency of passing the houses down through the generations. That's kind of what keeps the hill in business, is those strong generations of people trying to do what their elders did. Just to know that, you know, your family was here before is just something like I feel, spe I feel special to me. You know, I get to raise my kids and the house that I always wanted to be in growing up. What's really neat today, so many young people that are Italians and they're buying homes on the hill. That's what's really neat, that's terrific. People do move to the hill because they want to be immersed in the heritage and the culture and the way of life in the neighborhood. That is kind of the, the attraction of the hill is what brings them in and I think it's something that they want to be a part of. It's a neighborhood. Neighborhoods don't seem to exist anymore. These people, they can't believe that there's people living in houses next to a tavern with a bakery and a church and a shop. You know, they all get in their cars, leave their driveways, and they have to go five miles to a strip mall to find all the things they want. You know, this is how people all used to live, and this has always been that way. People want to come and see 
what our neighborhood looked like back in 1950 and 1960. It hasn't changed much. A few different businesses are open, but it's still the same neighborhood, still the same streets. It's still the same old neighborhood I grew up in, and it's got class. Little Italy's in America are pretty much gone. Many in other cities cling to the concept of Little Italy. It's merely a facade of what it used to be. Maybe it's one block long now, where there's mostly Italians, or, or two square blocks long. Or you still have a, a series of Italian restaurants in the area. Their storefronts, their restaurants, their, uh, you know, they sell flags and, and necklaces that have the, the Italian flag on it and call themselves Little Italy. The one here, we are still a neighborhood and we really exist in that Italian American tradition. Look at Little Italy's gone in New York. That was the capital of, of all Italians in the United States was Little Italy. It's gone and now it's Chinatown. Think about that. Little Italy turned into Chinatown. People sold out, man. You know, they sold out and went to Jersey. There's no other way to put it, you know? I mean, you know, so everything in New York is kind of like, you know, went this way and that way and this way and that way. And I, you know, attributed to, you know, life in, in New York City is definitely not as easy as life is here in, in a city like St. Louis, you know? We stayed, they moved. We stayed in our neighborhood. We fight for our neighborhood. We love our neighborhood. We didn't leave. And that's the one thing that if you go to New York, Little Italy, if you go to Chicago, if you go to Boston, they don't live in their community like we do. We live where we work. Loyalty from every Italian person there. They passed our homes down to their children. They passed their homes down to their children. They kept it Italian. And that's why it's an Italian neighborhood. You know, with the economy, you've been through two world wars, you've been through a Great Depression, you've been through a major recession, and this neighborhood has seen the worst and the best of this, of this country, and it's still vibrant, it's still attractive, it still has that sense of safety, community. So 20, 30, 40 years from now, I really don't see it going anywhere. I see it being here always. I don't think the hill's ever gonna go away. If you wanna name a neighborhood, it's always gonna be here. Hill's gonna be here. There's no two, two ways about that. You know what you got here and you know it's gonna remain the way it is. And as long as there's people that are around and are willing to do what is required to keep it the same, and that, it takes a lot of people into consideration. Now, you gotta have the church. If you don't have the church, you don't have it because that is the guiding light. People want to stay. People want to come back. People are looking for our community. Go back to the center, which is called the church and the school. What we're seeing in our school is we're seeing the potential next year of a fifth generation going through our school. And so those kind of things speak volumes to the people who have committed themselves to this neighborhood, to this identity as being Italian. And that's what it's all about, you know? And what we do is we maintain a beautiful campus, you know, so that as the church goes, the neighborhood goes.
They got my two sons born on the hill. I got a job. I got everything on the hill. The hill is like my time where I come from. See, a lot of people are Italian, loving, they play boats everything. They say, we say, no problem. Uh, Imbriolate. You know what I say, imbriolate? They make it. They don't like pizza and they peel it up. You take it. No, the labor roast, the anchovy, salami, salsiccia, spinach, spinach, and they two different things. Lasagna! Sante de Garbi, lasagna and lemon roast. Every Sante. 